Hello again, my friends. Welcome back to our ongoing Bible study of Luke. Uh, we're, today we're going to be in chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 1 through 18. I hope your new year has gotten off to a great start. Um, we are knee-deep into it. Uh, and, and we know that our um, our mission has not changed. We, we know that uh, we are still called to be followers and learners of, uh, of the Word. So with that in mind, um, uh, we will ask the Lord to bless our time together, and we will hop right into the study of Luke chapter 3. Pray with me, please. Father, thank you for um, uh, a, a, just a beautiful day outside the day, Lord. Thank you for the way that you watch over us, and you keep us, and you protect us. And um, um, Lord, we just, we just want to uh, I just want to lift up my praises and worship to you and uh, my, and and ask your your care and your healing hand on the people that are suffering from the COVID virus and, and ask uh, that you would strengthen and encourage uh, those people and their families and those around us who have problems totally unrelated to that uh, virus, Lord. We, we know that you are the answer to all of those questions and you are our strength in in times of trouble. So I pray that we would lean on that um, in in hard times, Lord, and in good times, Lord. Uh, keep us uh, ever mindful that you are the sovereign and the one who controls it all. So we ask that in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, Luke chapter 3 today, we're going to talk about uh, John the Baptist. Uh, that's what Luke chapter 3 concerns and his... Uh, uh, his mission given by God. So, um, what um, uh, we're going to start in in three, and I want to read verses one through six. We'll talk about that in just a moment. We'll go back and take a closer look at it. So, follow along with me. Uh, this is English Standard Version. Um, so, uh, John, uh, Luke chapter three, verses one through six. It says this: In the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judah, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Eturia and Tracon Traconitus, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went uh, into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, the prophet, uh, and I know you remember this because we just studied Isaiah in the last quarter, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall become straight and the rough places shall become level ways and all flesh shall see, shall see the salvation of God. Let's go back to verse one and and see if we can get a little, make a little sense of all this. Um, why did Luke? You know, Luke was a statistician. Luke was a, a learned man, a physician, uh, and and uh, he wanted uh, to lay out a clear uh, description of of the facts here, as as he said in chap back in chapter one. So with that in mind, Luke writes, uh, and, and he mentions all these people. Why? Why did he mention all of these people? Uh, what does this have to do with the story? Well, I think he did that just to nail down the timeline. And I did a little research and, and didn't have to look very far to find out that this is probably um, around 25 AD that uh, John the Baptist bursts onto the scene. Um, so the 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 people on this list were were uh, politicians, uh, governors, um, rulers, kings. You know, even cities had the the rulers of the cities referred to themselves as kings back in those days. So, or, or there were some were great men of great religious authority. The high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas is mentioned in here, and. Uh, in verse two, um, the that the, the says the word of God came to John the son of Zechariah in the wilderness. This is John the Baptist. John has been in the Bapt in the in the wilderness for some twenty over twenty five years, uh, and <clears throat> he 
he has been preparing himself, God has been preparing him for his one mission in life. Um, um, what was that mission? Verse 3, it says he went into all the region around the Jordan proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. You, you may remember back in Luke um, chapter 1 and verse 17, um, it says, uh, just the last part of verse 17, well, but let me read verse 17. He will go before him, before Jesus, in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. To make ready for the Lord a people prepared. That was John's, um, that was John's ministry. That was John's mission given by God for his life, to make the people ready for the coming of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. So um, it's God's timing. It said the word of God came to him at that particular time. And it says the words of Isaiah the prophet. It says, as it's written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight, Every valley shall be filled. Every mountain and hill shall be made low. The crooked shall become straight. The rough places shall become level ways. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Well, we know all flesh shall see the salvation of God because that speaks of the coming of Jesus. This, in, in verses, um, in, starting in verse 5, um, or even in verse 4, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Uh, every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill shall be made low. Well, you know that physically the world didn't become flat. What is he speaking of? The crooked shall become straight. Rough places shall become level ways. He's not talking about literal mountains and hills here. He's speaking of people. The mountains and hills, the, every valley should be shall be filled. The lower people, the people who were really honestly considered to be low in those days is the uh, those days the unimportant the downtrodden will be lifted up the valley will be filled every mountain and hill will be made low the the higher ups will be brought down the you've heard the foot of the the ground at the foot of the cross is level this is <laughs> this is where this come from jesus looks at people god looks at people and and doesn't see the important as high and mighty, or the lowly as unimportant, the one, people that we consider unimportant, God, God considers us all to be equal. The, the big, the, the, uh, as I said, the powerful, the, the little people, the uh, mighty people, they're all the same, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. That's available to all, both the, uh, both the, the, the big shots and the little people. So, uh, in verse 1, um, I mean, verse 7, here, here comes John the Baptist. So what, what was his message? I mean, God said, go prepare them. How did he do that? Well, listen, this is not um, really, in these days, might not go over if you stepped out on the stage and addressed your crowd like this. I'm going to read 7 through 9. Listen to verse 7. He said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, and here's the preacher's opening words, you brood of vipers. <laughs> really? This is, this is not, uh, this is not a uh, watered-down gospel here, my friends. You brood of vipers, who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now, the axe is laid at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Now, that's some open for a, for a, for a, uh, John's first recorded sermon. You brood of vipers. Vipers are um, snakes, small snakes, actually. Usually no more than a foot maybe 18 inches long, but they were deadly poisonous. They could slither anywhere. You couldn't find them, but when they bit you, you knew you'd been bitten. So 
he identifies these people in Matthew's gospel. Uh, you can go back and look it up in Mas Matthew chapter 3, somewhere around verse 7. Um, he, uh, he identifies these people as Sadducees and Pharisees, the people that had come out. He identifies them here. It says in verse 8, uh, don't begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. Now these were the religious uh, uh, upper crust, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. You probably know about them if you studied the Bible very much. They, um, they considered themselves, and they were learned in the law, they knew the law, but they 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 were largely hypocritical. Um, they they thought that they were remember they were the people who who needed to be brought down those mountains. These were some of them. They had very high opinions of themselves, and they considered themselves to be favored by God because they were just above those little people. They knew so much. They uh, were that they were so close to God that they. Uh, you know, they they made loud, they prayed loud. They made loud noises when they dropped their coins into the offering plate, so that they would be noticed. Just some of their hypocrisy, and they were full of self, just full of self righteousness and pride in themselves. Um, um, so they had standing, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, who came out to see John. Now, the it, what is this? We have Abraham as our father. The Jews thought that they would inherit salvation, that it could be inherited. We have Abraham as our father. We're of that line um, uh, of Israel. Uh, we're of the house of Abraham. So we, we're born into it. Well, guess what, my friends? You're not born into salvation, either um, in, in Old Testamental times or New Testamental times. And remember, this is Old Testamental at this point. Jesus hadn't come. He hadn't died on the cross at this point, so um, they, they were they were depending upon their lineage, uh, the um, as Abraham, um, as children of Abraham, to be what saved them. Don't depend upon your grand the fact that your grandmother was big in the church, or your mother, or your father was a deacon. So I'm okay. You're not. It's a one on one. Go to God personally kind of thing. So you, as I said, you can't inherit it. And that's what John is telling these people. You're, you're, that won't get you into heaven. Neither will all that noisy giving or loud praying. That won't get you there, my friend. That won't get you saved. So verse 9, it says, e even now, there's some urgency here. Even now, okay, get your act straight. The Lord is coming. Remember, that's his job, John's. Even now, the ax is laid at the root of the trees. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. What is he saying to these people? He is saying um, that that when when it, an axe you take an axe you chop down you hit it with hit the root of a tree with the axe it kills the tree. You cut the roots off, the tree dies. It's it's irreparable damage. It dies. So. He says, John, to these people, the, the evidence of your repentance, the evidence that you are turning to God is this, fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So um, how's your fruit? How's your fruit? And remember this... Um, this irreversible judgment, John wanted people to understand the gravity of the situation here. This irreversible judgment that he's talking about, taking the ax and cutting off the roots of the tree, is still part of the salvation equation today. Um, listen, once, once, um, once your time has passed, once your life, physical life, comes to an end, let's say, um, some people believe that that uh, then is the time to pray for people, for the people who have already died, that you can somehow um, pray them into heaven. It, that's not a biblical concept. John says, um, every tree that does not bear good fruit, that's a, an unsaved person, uh, is cut down and thrown into the fire. Too late then. Too late then. 
Um, let's look at uh, verses 10 through 14. So John comes out in, in these verses that we just looked at. John comes out and says his message, and this may not have been the very first thing that he said, but his message, the meat of his message was literally turn or burn. You, um, you don't want to get cut down and thrown into the fire. Um, change your ways, get ready. God is coming. Repent from your evil ways. Turn to God. Open your heart. He'll be here. And in these times, in 2021, he is present with us right now. So you don't have to wait. Uh, verse 10 says this. The crowds asked him, what then shall we do? Logical question. What shall we do? And he answered, whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none. And whoever has food is to do likewise. The tax collectors also came to came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? He said to them, Collect no more than you are authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what shall we do? And he said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusations, and be content with your wages. So the response of the crowd was this. By and large, what do we need to do? That's a good question. What do we need to do? You can ask yourself the same question. What do I need to do? What am I counting on for my salvation? Am I counting on the fact that I belong to the church? Am I counting on the fact that I pray? Am I counting on the fact that I read the Bible? Am I counting on the fact that I give a lot of money? If you're counting on anything but the fact that Jesus died for the forgiveness of your sins, all those other things are good things, but that's not what saves you. Saving faith is faith in Christ and in what he did on the cross, not any of that other stuff. Those are, like as I said, those are good things. Those are good fruits that John was talking about. So that's the evidence of your salvation. The crowd said, what do we do? What should we do? And John answered, well, whoever has two tunics um, is to share with him who has none. Whoever has food is to do likewise. And notice this, this is not, well, I'm really having a hard time. You know, I don't know if I can share anything with anybody because I'm really having a hard time. John did not, two tunics is not a rich man. Whoever has food, a person who has food is not necessarily a rich person. This is not just a command to the rich people. This is not a tax the rich scheme. This is an everyone shares with those who don't have. Tax collectors also came to him to be baptized. Now that's a bit strange. Um, tax collectors came to him who has to be baptized. The tax collectors were hated by by uh, the Jews and the Gentiles alike. They, they, they worked for Rome, the tax collectors. They collected tax from the people in the towns. Um, they sent they collected this money up. They sent it to back to Rome for the Roman government to pay the soldiers who um, <laughs> were in these towns with their literal foot on the neck of the people that they collected the taxes from. So, needless to say, the tax collector working for the oppressor was not a very popular guy around town. Also, the tax collectors could collect whatever uh, they could whatever they could get, whatever they could force the people to give, tax collectors could collect that. And they pocketed the overage uh, from what they sent to Rome. Rome had an amount, they collected that. Anything else they collected was, uh, was theirs. So they were not, they were seen as traitors, really, uh, by, by the people uh, that they lived with. So, so um, what should we do? And he said to them, verse 13, Collect no more than you are authorized to do. Do your job. Do it well. Send the money where it's supposed to go. Don't cheat people. Don't cheat people. That's, that's repentance right there. Verse 14, shoulder, soldiers also asked, and we, what shall we do? And he said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation and be content with your wages. This was a very corrupt society. People... Um, could cheat, people would cheat. Uh, he gave the same answer to the soldiers that he gave to the tax collector. And that answer is a good answer for you and me. 
treat people right. Don't abuse your power or your position. Maybe you have some power and position in your workplace. Maybe uh, um, even in your family. Don't abuse that power. Yeah, you're the head of the family. Don't, don't, uh, don't let that power go to your head. Treat people within and without your power, um, within and outside of it, um, don't abuse that power. So, um, so there were a lot of people who, who wanted to change, but they didn't know how. And living in that society, I'm sure they were afraid that if they started doing all this stuff, they would be run over, and, and some it was a financial hit. So John's answer, what do we do? An inner change. None of this stuff is a mere change of, it's, it's not uh, behavior modification. That's not what John was talking about. John was talking about repentance. An inner change, an inner change, a change from, of the heart, which manifests itself in good fruit. Good fruit, not bad fruit. You've seen the bad fruit. Now, good fruit, let's talk about that for just one second and, and, and we'll move on. Uh, we're almost done here. Good fruit. Um, there's a quote here that I want to, uh, I actually scribbled this down in the front of my Bible um, uh, when LaRue said this. I'm not sure if he was the originator of this because I've seen it somewhere else, but um, the, it, it has been said that the greatest evil of all is a substitution of human goodness for God's righteousness. The substitution of human goodness for God's righteousness. What gets what what is saving faith? God's righteousness imputed to you and to me by the fact that Jesus Christ said, I'll pay that penalty on that cross. If you substitute human goodness for that, you have you have just negated the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you substitute human goodness, well, if I'm good enough then God will like me. God's good. I'm good. Heaven's good. What could be wrong with that? Well, what could be wrong with that is your sin still is there. So um, human goodness is a result of salvation. It is a product of salvation. It is not a route to salvation. So please don't make that mistake. Um, Verses 15 through 18, the choice. John says, um, um, as the people were in expectation and all were question, questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ, John answered them all saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. There's that fire again. Unquenchable fire. Well, hey, you've seen fire. You've seen the results of a, of a fire. There's no, there's no restoration available on that. You've got to tear it down and start over. So, verse 18. With many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. Now he gave them he gave them a choice. They were in expectation. It says here in verse 15. And, and they didn't know is John, hey, is this the Messiah? He's preaching some good stuff here. He's uh is this is this the um is this the one we've all been waiting for? And John said in verse 16, I baptize you with water for cleansing. Um for, uh, but he who, is my, he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. You would untie someone's sandals just before you wash their feet. Uh, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now you could do a long study on that, on those verses there, the water, the Holy Spirit, the fire. Uh, but but the, the meat of the matter is this. John, John concedes, John informs people, it's really not a concession, um, that Jesus is mightier than he and that Jesus is worthy. He says, I am not even worthy to wash his feet. 
He is he is worthy of your complete submission and my complete submission. So uh, he he not only has the the might that John um, refers to here. He is mightier than me, but he also has the authority to do what to separate the true believers from the non-believers, the truth from the lies, the the hypocrites from the genuine believers. It says, um, 17, his winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn. Winnowing fork, they would pitch the wheat up into the air and as the wind blew, it would blow the chaff away. And the seed, the part you wanted to keep, would fall to the floor. Um, his threshing, his, um, his winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and gather wheat, that's the good stuff, into his barn. But the chaff, that's the bad stuff, the fake, the false, the useless, he will burn with unquenchable fire. There it is again, unquenchable fire. So uh, with many ex ex and many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. Now let me ask you this. Do you see this as good news? That um, some people will be cast into the eternal fire? Well, that's not good for them. Listen, the coming of Christ was a good thing for some, a bad thing for some. The second coming will be a very good day for genuine believers, for people who are depending upon something other than the shed blood of Christ for their salvation. It will be a very, very bad day. They have, they have been taught a lie, and the devil has deceived them. Now, here's what the Bible says. Um, there's still time to act. What do you do? Preach. Well, listen to the good news. The good news, gospel, is translated good news. That's where that word came from. The gospel. Christ died for you. Study that. Believe that. If you need information on that, First Baptist Church, fbclb.com. Contact me. We will, uh, we'll, we'll talk about it. Uh, what that actually means, practically speaking, to give your life to Christ. So, uh, um, but but the thing to remember is, is this: it, it's salvation comes not from what you do, but from what Christ has already done. I believe that's the that's the point of this whole lesson here. They came and asked him, "What shall we do?" And uh, Jesus came very shortly after that, and did it for us. So with that in mind, um, I want to encourage you to read chapter 6 in Luke. Next week we're going to skip over a few chapters and we're going to come back. That's the way the lesson's laid out. We'll get into that tomorrow. Chapter 6 is where we'll be next week. So um, let's uh, uh, thanks, for, thanks for tuning in again. And um, we're, we're about done here. Let's pray and we'll go. Father, thank you again for our time together for allowing us to do this. Thank you, Lord, that uh, hearts can still be reached all these years later through the preaching of John the Baptist and through the saving work of Jesus on the cross. Lord, we thank you. We praise you in his name. Amen.